Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of ideas, research, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Lisa Clark, Reference Librarian at the NOAA Central Library. Today's Library Seminar features two 2020 Knauss Fellows, Wenfei Ni and Cheyenne Steinbarger. Our program today is part of a monthly series where Knauss Fellows showcase their research. Today's seminar will be the last presentations for the Class of 2020, and I wish them luck in their next steps. Caitlin Lauder, a 2020 Knauss Fellow with OAR's Office of International Activities, will introduce our two speakers, each of whom will speak for 20 minutes, followed by five to seven minutes of questions and answers. Before I turn this webinar over to our speakers, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This usually will reset the software and resolve most technical issues. The presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel, as well as the Library Seminars website by later this afternoon. We will also be accepting questions throughout the webinar, which the speakers will address at the end of each of their presentations. Please feel free to type your questions in the question box on the right side of your screen at any time. I would suggest distinguishing uh, the speaker's name, either Wenfei or Cheyenne, so that we know who your question is for. So with that last suggestion, I thank you for attending this library seminar and turn the presentation over to Caitlin. Thank you, Lisa. Wenfei Ni is a 2020 Canals Fellow in NOAA Oceanic and Atmospheric Research, placed in the Climate Program Office, Modeling, Analysis, Prediction and Projection, MAP Program. She received her BS in Marine Science from Nanjing University, China, and graduated with PhD in Oceanography from the University of Maryland last spring. Her graduate research used numerical models to study the impacts of regional climate change in watershed nutrient management in Chesapeake Bay oxygen depletion zones. Off to you, Wenfei. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here today for the presentation. Uh, today is actually the graduation day for our 2020 class of Knauss Fellows. Uh, after such a memorable year with unique experiences, um, I'm excited to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about my thesis research in graduate school and how it is connected with uh, management. Uh, I have been working with uh, a CPO MAP program on the climate research programs during the course of my fellowship. Uh, and the topic of my talk today is about the impact of climate change and nutrient management on the long-term change of Chesapeake Bay hypoxia. Some of you um, might already be familiar with the concept of hypoxia in the ocean. So here I show the definition from the, uh, the, the, uh, the NOS website, which the hypoxia is the low depleted oxygen in a water body often leads to dead zones, which means regions where life cannot be sustained. The marine organisms have different tolerance on the uh, oxygen level to survive and thrive. So the, uh, the general threshold of the low oxygen level that threatens the most marine life is about um, two milligram per liter. Um, the recurring low oxygen condition would threaten the ecological health of coastal waters and reduce the ecological service um, that they can uh, provide. The occurrence of hypoxia is increasing in coastal waters worldwide and uh, um, mostly appears in estuaries, river dominated uh, shelves, and upwelling systems. Um, the instance of hypoxia has increased about uh, almost. Um, 30, 30 fold in the United States since 1960, with more than uh, three, 300 systems uh, recently experiencing hypoxia. Especially the, the northern uh, part of the uh, Gulf of Mexico has become the second largest eutrophic eutrophication related hypoxic zone in the world. Um, although coastal hypoxia has been caused could could be caused by a, a variety of factors. Uh, dramatic, the, the dramatic uh, increase in the number of U.S. Uh, hypoxic waters is linked to the eutrophication, uh, which is due to the uh, 
nutrient, which mostly is uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and organic matter enrichment from uh, human activities from the watershed. Um, in a typical estuary with uh, uh, occurrence of summer hypoxia, uh, with excess excess uh, nutrient uh, input into the into the estuary, it can promote the uh, algae overgrowth in the surface water. As uh, as the dead algae uh, are decom decomposed by the bacteria, uh, um, the, ox the oxygen is consumed in the process, while uh, oxygen repl replenishment from the upper layer is not sufficient. So that's when hypoxia occurs in the bottom water. Um, in my study, uh, I take Chesapeake Bay as my um, study area, and uh, I believe some of you might drive across the Bay, Bay, Bay Bridge in the summer to the beach. Uh, have you ever thought uh, that beneath the pretty bay view, uh, there forms a dead bone that threatens tons of uh, marine life? Um, the hypoxic area of Chesapeake Bay could stretch from the Bay Bridge in uh, close to Annapolis down to the Virginia side. Um, up to one third of the uh, the bay water <coughs> could uh, suffer from hypoxia in the summer. And this, uh, on the figure, um, in the figure, you can um, clearly see that the hypoxic water volume increased synchronously uh, with the increasing uh, input of nitrogen since 1940s. Um, the source of uh, uh, the, the nutrient uh, into the Chesapeake Bay mainly uh, includes the uh, discharge of waste waters uh, and uh, uh, runoff from the agriculture land and uh, some urban areas. Um, since the Chesapeake Bay Agreement uh, of 1983 uh, to reduce the pollution and restore the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, the nitrogen load actually um, declined slight, uh, modestly afterwards. Uh, well, you, you can see um, the hypoxic volume appears to still maintain at high level. If we look at the numbers more uh, closely, that uh, re uh, the report, scientific reports and uh, studies has uh, showed that about 15 percentage of uh, nitrate and 25 percentage of phosphate was reduced in the Susquehanna River, which is a uh, uh, main tributary of Chesapeake Bay during uh, during the last past three three decades. Um, but the water column, uh, but only partial of the uh, the water quality has been restored. Like the local, there's there's signs showing there's local risk re recovery of seagrass bed. Um, and no observed decrease in uh, summer hypoxic volume maximum has, uh, has, uh, uh, has, occur has occurred. Meanwhile, um, uh, there's more and more uh, uh, recognition that the climate change has indeed uh, occur, uh, happening in this area, and the surface uh, water temperature could increase, uh, over this region could increase by uh, about 1.5 to 3 um, Celsius degrees, and the sea level rise as the ocean uh, over the, I think, uh, at the uh, at the ocean boundary side could be four to ten millimeter per year. So, um, based on these facts, about uh, here come we. Uh, I have a hypothesis that here, that is there is could be a competition between the climate change impact and the nutrient reduction uh, over the past three decades. Um, that leads to the current high level of a hypoxic um, condition. He, uh, so the question is, what is the dominant force of the Chesapeake Bay hypoxia trend that, that lead to the hypoxia trend during the, during, uh, the past three decades from uh, 1985 to 2016? Um, uh, Although there are uh, relatively long-term monitoring uh, water quality measurement and records in the uh, Chesapeake Bay, um, there are still things that monitoring data cannot tell us because it, it is lack of uh, the continuous uh, uh, measurement in time, also in space, which need a lot of money and uh, labor. Um, 
also the restriction of the observational data is that it cannot separate the individual effect from uh, effect from the multiple uh, multiple forces so in order to answer the two questions uh, that we're concerned about, which is a driving force between the climate change and the nutrient reduction for the this the, the long-term change of uh, Chesapeake Bay hypoxia during this period, and even more, what will be the future changes? So, uh, to answer these two questions, we need to another tool that which is numerical model to answer these questions. So the numerical model has merit that it can fill the data gap. Uh, that the, the monitor data uh, had and also with this tool we can design like various experiment trying to like uh, manipulate the uh, manipulate like, uh, separate the individual uh, uh, effect of the forcing and the exam which one should uh, should 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 be the driving force and uh, furthermore uh, with with a numeric model we can um trying to do some downscale climate projection to um to predict what's gonna happen in the future um so i use the numeric model as a main tool for this research um so you can see here this is the model domain uh, <clears throat> i developed uh, uh over the uh, over uh, um over my research the whole research and uh, the tool I'm using is, uh, is based on a physical and a biogeochemical uh, model, uh, ROMS RCA, which is quite popular in the ocean uh, studies. And uh, uh, I, I simulate the period of, uh, of 1985 to 2016, the 62 years, uh, like hydrological and also the biological condition in the bay. Um, as a, so this is a, a, as, a, as a base run. For this study and also furthermore i developed uh, some scenario experiment uh trying to uh, uh separate the the, the, the four thing that i'm concerned with and and examine the individual uh, effect um so um the the main focus of the model output here i'm concerned is the water level and temperature and the oxygen condition how that change uh with time, uh, in in order to um, in order to uh, uh, like uh, obtain the uh, more reasonable trend analysis, I I I use a more sophisticated statistic analysis, which uh, which the main the main uh, purpose here is trying to extract the long term trend from the mega data of a model output. And uh, you can see here, uh, this uh, equation this, this equation can actually uh, extract the, the, trend, the different components of the time series of the, like, for example, oxygen. But what I'm most concerned is the long-term trend. Uh, the most, one uh, important step to uh, design experiment scenario is to um, discern the effect of climate change and nutrient reduction. So here, you can hear uh, this is the model forcing uh, which uh, is the sea, uh, water level on the ocean boundary. Um, you can see there is an increase in the sea level on the ocean boundary. And uh, also there is an increase in the surface air temperature at the atmosphere boundary. But there's a slightly decrease in the nutrient input in both nitrate and phosphate, uh, if you see the black line. Um, so what I do here is uh, beyond the base run we just have. Um, I just remove the uh, remove the sea level rise trend uh, <clears throat> for one scenario and and uh, create a, a model scenario called the trend sea level rise run. And similarly, I remove the <clears throat> warming trend in the uh, atmosphere forcing and the developed uh, the trend temperature run and uh, similar. I kind of uh, remove the reduction, nutrient reduction trend, which means the nutrient uh, nutrient level maintains at a high level, which is the dash red line shows in the figure. So I call this uh, the trend nutrient run. So 
that is the uh, um, scenario uh, and the base run we're going to use for the uh, next following uh, slides. Uh, first, uh, let's look at the comparison between the base, base run simulation and the observation over the world, uh, on the water level. Um, these are the five like uh, gauge stations uh, along the main, main channel of Chesapeake Bay. Um, you can actually see very clearly there's an increasing trend that is the uh, sea level rise. So the model uh, can capture the similar uh, sea level ri rise rate as observation with the rate is about um, 15 centimeters over the 32 years. Um, regarding with the warming in the, uh, the, 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 in the bay, the signal is not as clear as, uh, as, as sea level rise. But, but generally, the model um, from the two point to uh, uh, compare, compare with observation uh, with two uh, observing points in the bay, the simulated surface water temperature was increased by um, 1.2 to 1.8 Celsius degree over the 32 years, which is very close to other like studies and uh, all, as well as uh, observation studies. Um, so here comes the most exciting part. Uh, one of the most important findings appears when we actually make the comparison between the different model scenarios uh, on the long-term trend of the bottom oxygen in the middle bay area where the uh, hypoxia usually occurs. So um, the the left uh, panel shows surface oxygen and the, the right panel shows the bottom oxygen um, concentration. That, uh, these, all, these are all the uh, long-term trend, so not the actual uh, the concentration. So we can clearly see there is an overall decline in both the surface and the bottom water uh, of oxygen um, concentration. And, and uh, the value is about 0 0.3 milligram per liter over the 32 years. Um, uh, from the comparison, the most striking part is the uh, the detrend temperature. This scenario shows the la largest difference from the base run. Um, you can see the from the the, the red line. So it generally has very little or dampen decrease in the trend in the surface water. And uh, particularly, it actually shows slightly increase in the trend in the bottom water. However, the, uh, the detrend sea level rise, detrend nutrient reduction uh, scenario shows very minor difference from the base run. Um, if we further look at the, uh, the relative change of bottom oxygen uh, between the scenarios and the base runs, in the most recent decades. So it tell us some story about the seasonal change of the bottom oxygen. Uh, still, um, we first, we first if we look at the, <clears throat> the, the detrend temperature scenario and uh, the, war the warming would cause the most significant decline of oxygen in the spring. Um, well, the nutrient reduction, uh, the green line is negative, means it will help uh, uh, increase the, uh, the oxygen level in the bay. So it actually increased the bottom uh, oxygen level modestly, but not as much as <clears throat> what uh, temperature increase take away from, uh, from the oxygen. So it actually, in the end, it was overwhelmed by the warming. Um, let's go further um, to the next question, so about the future. Um, so uh, the global climate models uh, usually can uh, uh, have important scientific insights into the evolution of the climate system from, the mon from months to century scales. However, the special um, scales by, uh, represented by the global uh, climate models uh, may not be as fine as the uh, uh, end use application requires. Um, so the, the raw output, its raw output generally contain biases relative to observation data. Um, so in Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, 
the regional downscaling method uh, that have been applied to refine the global climate model output uh, and address the regional uh, biases in the uh, in the in the global um, climate model output already. Uh, so here, um, so um, the, the 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 upper panel, you can see that is the regional uh, climate model grade over the uh, the United States and uh, part of the Canadian uh, Canada. Um, uh, so uh, there are several of the combinations uh, of uh, of the uh, global climate model and the regional climate model, and uh, indicate different uh, a kind of a large spread of the uh, future projection of the uh, change in uh, temperature and uh, as well as the uh, river discharge, a uh, fresh water discharge into the bay. Uh, uh, however, they act, uh, there are still some consistency. Um, for example, in the in the in the seasonal change in the in the change of uh, air temperature, which they all positive means the definite, almost definitely they're going to be um, going to be warmer in the future, especially during the summer. Um, and the, in the for the river uh, river discharge for the river flow, it kind of spread even more uh, around the uh, zero, but. Uh, one common uh, conclusion here between the models, uh, be between the climate model, is we probably will have a wetter winter uh, in the future. Um, with the same set of uh, numerical model, and uh, keep in mind the the, the w and also uh, using the uh, the the regional the, the climate model input um, for the simulation. So we can actually get what the future will be like for the Chesapeake Bay um, and its hypoxia. So um, this, this actually, these three um, three panels actually show show the three different uh, model combination I select, a climate model uh, combination I select, and it all uh, re it all shows that if the river nutrient uh, rivering uh, nutrient input remain at a current high level in the future. There's def there, the hypoxic area will expand vertically and horizontally, um, and the hypoxic volume will increase by like 10 to 30 percentage from the the late uh, 20th century to the mid 21st century. Also, there are going to be some some er, uh, early shift of the timing of the hypoxia. Uh, again, here temperature appears also appear to be the major factor. Uh, for the future uh, oxygen decline, and the 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 warming causes the loss of oxygen. That's mainly due to the reducing of uh, oxygen solubility. And uh, if we calculate the, the the content of oxygen in the bottom water and the uh, the difference between the saturated level and the actual content, we can see. Um, it's a the change of oxygen solubility account for like about 50 percentage of the decline, but also uh, biological consumption will also increase with uh, with increasing temperature, which will lead to the speeding up of the the seasonal cycle of the uh, the uh, seasonal cycle of nutrient, especially nutrient and oxygen in the bay water, and leading to an earlier termination of uh, a hypoxia. So in 20, 2020, the EPA established uh, in Chesapeake Bay program actually established uh, Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily uh, load as a pollution diet that set the limit uh, on the amount of nutrient and sediment. And uh, more recently, the Bay program is developing the model tools to actually quantify the effect of the climate change on the, on the, on the watershed and the bay. Um, so that means uh, uh, they actually access the climate change risk to the um, Chesapeake Bay water quality and um, even make further make adaptive plans. Uh, so uh, the main takeaways of the uh, my uh, research, my study here is the climate change will likely contributing to the observed increase uh, in the coastal dead zones 
and especially in the Chesapeake Bay case study, the more the most striking uh, finding here is the warming actually offsides the uh, the benefit of nutrient reduction to mitigate the summer hypoxia. And uh, if we we keep if if we keep uh, uh, generating high level nutrient input into the bay, the bay hypoxia will uh, deteriorate with future uh, climate change. So that's my talk today. And uh, please feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Wenfei. That was fantastic. Um, audience, we will take the next five minutes to answer your questions. So please type them into the questions chat box and I will read them to Wenfei. And while you were speaking, people were adding questions. So um, the first question, Wenfei, is did you encounter any readings for conditions prior to 1985? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Uh, did you encounter any readings for conditions prior to 1985? Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, the other, so this is a part of my CD study. So the, uh, the other part of my CD study kind of um, uh, dig more into what happens. So during the eutrophication stage, that is a, a rapid increase of the nutrient input into the bay and how the bay hypoxia uh, response to the increase of the nutrient uh, load load and uh, so is it what what, what the question mean oh I, I think uh, just looking at um, models before 1985 um, here's another question um, in areas that have improved how have they been expanded um, sorry uh, in in areas that have improved in the bay uh -huh. How, how, how has that been explained? Uh, has been proved? Uh, improved, like gotten better. Oh, uh, improved. Um, yeah, so actually there's a, uh, there's a actually improved in the base. So um, what my, my study here is mostly um, focusing on the, the main bay, uh, main stem of the Chesapeake Bay. I think in the tributary, some of the tributary area, so, when where the uh where the like the for example the organic matter um would, would be the uh the, the the dominant source of the oxygen depletion rather than the nutrient so that um could be the reason so with the uh, the nutrient reduction uh plan so that is kind of a direct uh cut off uh from the 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 uh from the previous uh um loading so that uh, the change is more instant um, than the nutrient part if I uh, explain that correct <laughs> I think you did excellent thank you um, another question asks is the increase in the water level trend normal based on earthly cycles uh, uh, on what cycles uh, earthly like just the you know the earth cycles uh you mean the the increasing uh water level mm -hmm. yeah so that yeah. that increasing water level is i just i detrended all the uh the tidal um the tidal part of the water level and uh, that's only the long-term trend left so i think uh 30 years i think it's pretty long uh for the uh it's it uh I, although there are some um there might be some decadal changes of uh, variations of the water level but i think so with like 30 years or even more um the time span so the 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 the, the sea level rise could be um okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and this is going to be our last question. Uh, we, we do have more, but we, we, we're running out of time. Uh, the last question is, have previous models of global warming been accurate? If so, how is this GCM any different? Oh, so here, uh, maybe I just <laughs> speak too fast. So here, uh, the, 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 the climate model I use here is not GCM. It's just like the global climate model has very coarse resolution of grade. So here the downscale of to the uh, regional climate model. So we, we just use another set of uh, regional model and use a, a global uh, climate model as a boundary. 
to drive the regional fine, with fine de, a fine grade uh, regional model. So in this case, we just believe um, uh, in this case it can just represent better finer scale process of the uh, on a regional level and have um, accurate more accurate uh, prediction of the temperature change. I think. Excellent. I appreciate you taking all those questions and. Um, I'm now going to transfer the screen over to our next speaker uh, while um, while uh, Caitlin Lauder introduces her. Thank you very much, Wenfei. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And fantastic talk, Wenfei. That covered a lot of work with a sobering conclusion. As our last 2020 Canals Fellow speaker, I'm really happy to introduce Cheyenne Steinberger. She's a 2020 Canals Fellow in NOAA Oceanic and Atmospheric Research placed in the Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program. She received her MSc in Marine Biology from the University of North Carolina Wilmington in December 2019. Cheyenne's research focus areas included ecotoxicology, aquaculture, and marine debris. Her master's thesis explored the impact of microplastic pollution across multiple life stages of the Black Sea bass. Over to you, Cheyenne. Thanks, Caitlin, for that introduction. Thank you all for joining today at the last Lunch and Learn. I'm excited to talk about my work done in my master's thesis for the first time in over a year. So today we'll be talking about Tiny Plastics, Big Problem, an assessment of microplastic ingestion in a commercially valuable species, the Black Sea bass. So this project was funded through the NOAA Marine Debris Program, and we have concluded all of the work and are in the process of finalizing all of the manuscripts. We designed this project that served as the basis for my master's thesis to assess the impact of microplastic exposure in the Black Sea Bass across multiple life stages using a field and laboratory component. This talk is going to focus on two of the laboratory exposures at the larval and early juvenile life stages, as well as an assessment of plastic ingestion in the wild caught adults collected from North Carolina. The objectives of this work were to quantify microplastic ingestion in larval black sea bass exposed to virgin and chemically treated microspheres directly in the water and via trophic transfer from their microzooplankton prey, to also measure physiological endpoints such as immune response and oxygen consumption in early juvenile black sea bass following a 96 hour direct exposure to virgin microspheres, chemically treated microspheres, and virgin microfibers. And finally, to assess the occurrence of plastic ingestion in wild caught adults collected off the coast of North Carolina. Before we jump into the sea bass and the science, I always like to give a precursor to plastic pollution. So let's start at the source. Plastics are synthetic organic polymers and they're derived from carbon rich materials like petroleum and natural gas. They're widely used because they're valuable to our society. They have diverse industrial, commercial, and individual applications. We actually didn't start producing plastics on a global scale until shortly after World War II, and the demand for plastic has steadily increased over the last several decades, driving the current global annual plastic production to well over 368 million metric tons in 2019. And this growing demand is largely due to the fact that plastics, like I said, are useful. They have a versatile, durable, and they're lightweight and cost effective. Interestingly and unfortunately, it's these traits that make plastic so useful in our society are the exact traits that make plastic pollution problematic in the environment. They are synthetic polymers manufactured specifically to withstand biological degradation, allowing them to persist and accumulate in the environment. Most of the plastic produced is used in packaging products, think snack containers or beverage containers, and are typically discarded after a single use. Once the uh, plastics are discarded, there are several pathways for this debris to enter the aquatic environment. Riverine transport and wastewater discharges are predominant mechanisms for plastic to travel from land-based sources, while accidental or purposeful losses from commercial fishing, shipping, and tourism industries contribute to plastic loss directly at sea. So microplastics sound kind of like a buzzword and they've certainly been growing in concern and the field itself is relatively new and has grown drastically over the last 10 years. These are synthetic and anthropogenic particles that range between uh, one micron and five millimeter in size. They are ubiquitous and persistent in aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, 
due to the increasing load of waste entering the environment. They have been detected in the Arctic, Antarctic, and the Mariana Trench. Microplastics come from both primary and secondary sources. So some primary microplastics include microbeads, pellets, and fibers manufactured for specific industrial and personal purposes. And applications of these primary microplastics include personal care product exfoliants, shown in this toothpaste above, industrial scrubbers and blasters, as well as textile fibers. Additionally, primary microplastics include resin pellets, shown here below. These are called nurdles, and they serve as the raw material for making the plastic products we use every day. Secondary microplastics form through the breakdown of larger plastic items, and it's difficult to estimate the load of secondary plastics entering the environment because the process is not uniform. An example would be to take a plastic water bottle that's left on the beach. It's exposed to UV radiation from the sun. Taking this UV radiation with a prolonged exposure as well as wave action promotes embrittlement and fragmentation of this plastic polymer. And over time, the plastic bottle will break down into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually forming microplastics. Another really important source of secondary microplastics that's gaining a lot more attention recently are uh, the fibers shed from your clothing during the laundering process. And so they shed for, thousands shed from each article of clothing traveling through the wastewater treatment plant where some are collected and then entering into the aquatic environment. Microplastic ingestion has been documented in the laboratory and in the environment across a variety of taxa, ranging from zooplankton to fishes to cetaceans. The trophic transfer of microplastics has also been reported both in the field and in the lab, and uh, the impacts of this relationship are not well understood. Since we'll be talking about the black sea bass, I wanted to give a precursor of some previously reported effects demonstrated in other species of fin fish. We've seen the potential for microplastics to accumulate in the gastrointestinal tract of the organism and then translocate to other organ systems and tissues. There's also been documented endocrine disruption, reduction in energy reserves, and modified lipid metabolism. While I think it's really important to highlight the negative impacts, it's just as important to highlight the fact that sometimes we don't see a negative impact following exposure to microplastics, and sometimes we see differing results reported for the same species. There's a lot of variation in the results that we see across the field, and this depends largely on the type of microplastic you use, the concentration used, any associated chemicals, as well as this lack of standardized methods that is the field is getting better about, but that still leads to some variation in all the reports that we have. So one of my biggest criticisms that I think is going in the right direction is that there's a considerable lack of information regarding commercial species and how they are impacted by plastic pollution. Our group decided to use the black sea bass, Centropristis striata, as a model to study the impacts of plastic pollution Firstly, this species, uh, the early life stages occupy estuaries and coastal waters. And these coastal habitats are especially impacted by plastic pollution due to their proximity to those terrestrial inputs, as well as tidal processes that provide favorable conditions for debris to accumulate. As the black sea bass matures, it becomes more demersal, meaning it moves closer to the ocean floor. And this ocean floor has been documented as a sink for microplastics, especially microfibers. Further, this species grazes opportunistically, and it led us to think that this might increase the um, accidental ingestion of microplastics from the water column as the fish mistakes plastic for prey or possibly consuming prey items that are already containing plastic. And again, this is a commercially valuable and recreationally valuable species, particularly along the East Coast. So we wanted to address that critical knowledge gap and move away from the use of model organisms. I'm going to jump in to our exposures and explanations. I do wanna add a note. I'm actually not going to be showing any data or graphs. I have all of those in the supplemental slides and I'm happy to chat about them during the questions or via email. But my former advisor actually gave a much larger one NOAA science seminar talk a few months ago and I don't wanna to be too duplicative. And I thought it'd be better to give a good comprehensive overview of the project. So for our larval laboratory experiment, it was a very simple two hour exposure. And I wanna provide a little bit of justification for some of the decisions we made. 
we elected to use 10 to 20 micron low density polyethylene microspheres. Um, and we selected this size fraction for two reasons. One of which we used microzooplankton or tintinid ciliates as prey items in this trophic transfer exposure. And we needed to select a size fraction that could be readily ingested by these ciliates. Further recent reports have alerted us that uh, these smaller size fractions of plastics can actually be more toxic to fish during their early life stages. We chose LDPE due to its extensive use in single use plastic products, as well as fishing gear. We have two levels of treatment for our, both our direct ingestion and trophic transfer exposures. We firstly wanted to investigate whether virgin uh, versus chemically treated plastics. So one of our groups was just rinsed clean LDPE. The next, we treated our LDPE microspheres with a adsorbed aqueous pollutant. This is phenanthrene. It's a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, and it's a byproduct of fossil fuel combustion that's commonly detected in the aquatic environment. We also treated our plastics with a plastic additive, 2,4-ditert-butylphenol. And plastic additives serve a variety of purposes as flame retardants, stabilizers, antioxidants. Their ultimate goal is to prevent that breakdown of the plastic product itself. And this was a big knowledge gap in the field when we first started this study. So it was important that we included a plastic additive in our approach. Additionally, we exposed our fish to three different concentrations of these virgin and chemically treated microspheres. The lower end of the spectrum is supposed to be more reflective of environmental concentrations, while the higher end was to be more consistent with previous laboratory exposures at the time. So just briefly, the larval fish for the direct exposures were simply exposed to these plastics in the water for two hours. And then for the trophic transfer exposure, we first presented these plastics to our microzooplankton prey items. Once the uh, prey items had an hour to feed upon the plastics, they were then presented to the larval black sea bass to mimic trophic transfer. And these results from our laboratory larval exposure provided some important insight about the role microplastics play during the larval stage of the black sea bass, especially considering their food chain interactions. So looking at this micrograph on the left, you see an individual tintinid ciliate with five microspheres in its vacuole. And here we demonstrated that ciliates will ingest microplastics as long as it falls within their preferred size fraction and they will do so regardless of chemical treatment, meaning that the ciliates did not significantly consume virgin versus chemically treated plastics. They ingested them regardless of chemical treatment. We also learned that larval black sea bass are at a greater risk for exposure to microplastics via ingestion of their contaminated prey items rather than consuming them directly from the water. This is not surprising given what we know about their opportunistic feeding strategy, but this does have important implications, especially considering that these microzooplankton were not discriminating against the chemically treated plastics. We also learned that the black sea bass larvae were not discriminating against ciliates that had ingested virgin plastics or chemically treated plastics. And a micrograph you see here down below, it's shown in pink because we used a polarizing light microscope with a filter to provide contrast between plastic and tissue. These two plastics remaining in the GI tract of this larvae are a result of the trophic transfer. So this particular larva was not exposed to plastics directly. Here we highlight that microzooplankton can serve as significant vectors of microplastics to higher trophic organisms. Moving right along to the 50, 60 days post hatch range of our early juveniles. The design for the juvenile feeding experiment is very similar to that of our larval experiment. We maintained the same polymer type as LDPE, the same types of chemicals as phenanthrene and 2,4-ditert-butylphenol, and the microplastic concentrations also remained the same. For this exposure, however, we added a virgin microfiber treatment group as LDPE microfibers. As I said, microfibers are a growing area of concern and we wanted to make sure our approach reflected that. And additionally, these juveniles were exposed daily for 96 hours instead of just a two hour exposure. To assess the physiological effects of a short term microplastic exposure, we measured uh, respiration and an additional subset of individuals were used to participate in an immune response assay at the culmination of this 96 hour period. 
And so we had also planned to have additional subset of GI tissues as well as gill tissues taken from each replicate. And we also conducted a trophic transfer experiment where here we were using larval inland silversides to then be fed to the early juvenile black sea bass. Unfortunately, those last three components that I just described were all lost because of Hurricane Florence actually hitting our laboratory building and destroying all the freezers. So we don't have that information. Thankfully, we did at, at the culmination of the study, we were able to do those oxygen consumption and immune response trials. And we learned that juvenile black sea bass are susceptible to short-term physiological impairment in terms of increased oxygen consumption and an altered immune response following a 96-hour exposure to some, but not all of our microplastic treatments. What we learned primarily is that microfibers present a greater risk to the respiratory system in finfish. And because our juvenile sea bass that were exposed to the virgin microfiber treatments demonstrated the most significant increase in oxygen consumption compared to all other groups. And we believe that the microfibers were likely either becoming entrapped within the gills or passing through and still causing inflammation in that really sensitive area. This would have been a great opportunity for us to analyze those gill tissues to determine uptake and the level of damage there. But again, unfortunately, we did not have those. This was another interesting result that we saw that we did not expect. Um, a repressed immune response was observed in these early juvenile black sea bass in response to only the virgin microspheres and only at the highest concentration. I'm not going to speculate as to why this is the result that we got. We were expecting maybe the microfibers to cause a greater or a more repressed immune response or even one of our chemically treatments. Um, but we think that having, again, that additional information about uptake, either through the gills or through the GI tract, might further elucidate why we observed this relationship. I encourage others who are doing these types of exposures to focus on chronic exposures, moving into that longer term study where we can further explore these relationships. And finally, my favorite part of the entire project was the wild caught component. And we worked with the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries to obtain 101 wild caught black sea bass from three locations. Two of our locations were near shore artificial fishing reefs, and the third location was more offshore off of Beaufort. And while this talk has primarily focused on microplastics, I'm going to introduce a new term called macroplastics. Macroplastics are anything above that five millimeter dimension and we isolated three from our 101 samples. This image showing here is this blue piece of, we think it's either a tape or like a wrapper from a beverage bottle. And using a technique called Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy or FTIR, we were able to determine the identity of this plastic as polyethylene terephthalate, and that is the number one on the recycling codes. The other two micro, macroplastics, excuse me, that we isolated from our samples were identified to be polyvinyl alcohol. As you can see, this is a fishing lure, and based on texture and the identity of the plastic, we also think this was a fishing lure. Polyvinyl alcohol is a water-soluble polymer that's used in fishing gear to sort of dissolve in the water and attract the fish to come in. So I think it's really interesting that we uncovered those. But moving forward with our microplastic ingestion, Using the same samples of those 101 fish, we visually dissected and looked for any of those larger pieces like the macroplastics. The GI tracts were then chemically digested and passed through three different series of filtrations. And at each filtration step, we isolated what we thought were suspected microplastics to then be subjected to micro FTIR. So with micro FTIR, we had roughly 70 suspected plastics, and we were only able to verify 26 of those from 21 individual fish out of the 101 total samples. Microfibers are by and large the leading type of ingested microplastics, and this is consistent with the current status of literature where people have determined presence and absence of microplastics in a variety of species. To give you a little taste of some of the fibers that we uncovered, the top here is a polyester fiber. This is a synthetic textile fiber used in many athletic gear or moisture wicking clothing. And the bottom one is a little more interesting. This is diglycyl ether bisphenol A, 
It's a constituent of epoxy resins and is commonly used in marine construction, adhesives, boat repairs, and five out of the 26 verified microplastics were identified as this material. These results indicate that lost and discarded fishing gear, as well as marine construction materials, can be major contributors to black sea bass plastic ingestion, but this is not surprising considering that nearly 70% of our individuals were collected from artificial fishing reefs where these types of materials will be present. So this study really aimed to address several critical knowledge gaps, particularly by using a commercial marine fin fish species and assessing impacts across multiple life stages, and where we added a microfiber treatment as well as bringing in the plastic additive. This was the first study to evaluate microplastic ingestion in the black sea bass fishery. We were able to verify that microzooplankton are important vectors of microplastics to larval black sea bass via trophic transfer, posing important implications potentially for estuarine and coastal habitats. And we also determined that at least in the laboratory, early juvenile black sea bass are negatively impacted by exposure to microfibers, likely via the gills. This is important to consider given that microfibers dominate the type of microplastics ingested by wild caught black sea bass, indicating that there's likely multiple avenues of exposure. And ultimately our concern is if these juveniles are consistently exposed to fibers in the wild, there could be long-term risk about their respiration, physiology, and eventually growth and survival. Future research is necessary to fully understand and appreciate how commercial fin fish will be affected by microplastics of various sizes, shapes, and polymer types, as well as the role of microplastics as one of a suite of multiple stressors. I'll be the first to raise my hand to say, I don't think microplastics are the most immediate threat to our coastal ecosystems, but when paired with overharvest, ocean warming, and hypoxia, I think they're definitely an important stressor to consider. With so much of the global fisheries production and aquaculture being utilized for human consumption, it's important to determine if trophic transfer of microplastics and associated chemicals present a risk of exposure to humans by way of seafood consumption, particularly those coastal, tribal, and fishing communities that depend on seafood for their subsistence and livelihood. And it's important to note that humans can be exposed to plastics through a variety of mechanisms in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. This is just a shameless plug. If you would like to learn more, this is a review paper we published last year about microplastic occurrence and effects in commercially harvested North American finfish and shellfish, and I've linked this here. With that, I'll conclude thanking again the Marine Debris Program for funding this work, the University of North Carolina Wilmington, where I conducted the studies, and a variety of other stakeholders who were involved. With that, I'll happily take any questions and any we don't get to, or if we wanna further discuss, my email's right here. Thank you so much, Diane, that's wonderful. I We are getting lots of questions, so uh, we'll just take the, a few minutes uh, to answer a few of them, and the rest I will forward to you uh, so that you can answer them offline. The first one asks, could you please specify what type of immune response, oops, I'm sorry, uh, was measured? Sure, that's a great question. I just didn't have time to fully dive into it. We, using this method uh, developed in other fish by Breckels and Neff in 2013, used this chemical called phytohemagglutinin. It's a lectin derived from red kidney beans. And so what you can do is post-exposure, you take your fish and you measure the caudal peduncle, which is that base of skin right before the tail. And we measured it three times. You then inject the fish with phytohemagglutinin and you inject your control fish with like a phosphate buffered saline solution to serve as the control. And then you put the fish in a recovery tank for 24 hours and then you come back and you remeasure that caudal peduncle three times taking the average. A fish that would have pronounced swelling in, demonstrates a strong immune response that would not be as repressed compared to fish that did not have swelling in their caudal peduncle. So, T cells are recruiting to that area at the site of the injection, and that's what we're measuring, whether there's T cells actively recruiting and if the fish had compromised immune system or not. Excellent, thank you for that response. Uh, the next question asks, were, were, were any biodegradable plastics encountered? 
I don't know that we specifically encountered biodegradable plastics. There were a few, so micro FTIR is a really useful tool, but sometimes certain materials show up as um, specific things. So anything biodegradable-ish related um, or natural related showed up sometimes as chitin or simply as cellulose. So it's more difficult to elucidate what types of materials those would be, but it's much easier to identify those synthetic materials like I showed earlier. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what, this person is asking for you to show the reference again, if you could. Oh, sure. It's published Limnology and Oceanography Letters. And um, you can look up Britta Beckler as the first author, but I should come up as the second. Excellent. Uh, next question. Will your work directly influence plastic input into coastal waters? It will not, unfortunately. Um, I think it's important that we currently learn about what we're dealing with as it's happening. But ultimately, our role as individuals is to do what we can, but there's this larger societal responsibility that we have to be aware of. So we're hoping our information can be used, you know, to encourage better decision making, at least at the perhaps the local level or at least raise awareness. But ultimately, there's a larger issue at hand of plastic input to the environment directly. Wonderful. And this will be their last question, although there are more, and I will send those to you, Shan. Uh, this last question asks, do some of the component materials of artificial reefs potentially contain plastics? Yes, so I will back up just very, very quickly. So this polymer type that we identified throughout five of those, um, five of our 26 microplastic samples, we do think this came from the artificial reef. And sometimes, I don't know how all artificial reefs are crafted, but working with North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, we learned that a lot of the materials used to make those artificial reefs are concrete slabs or you know, tossed aside other materials that promote really great fish recruitment in the area and they serve as they serve their purpose well. But those these types of materials that can be used as binders or as stabilizers can then shed from those larger pieces. And we're wondering if that's what happened at the artificial reefs. Thank you so much. Well, that last question concludes our time. Um, I want to make one quick plug for the library. Uh, please help us determine the future of the NOAA Library Network by completing our survey, which is active uh, through tomorrow, so it ends soon, the 22nd. If you are a NOAA employee or con contractor, please go to www.library.noaa.gov for the link, and thank you in advance. Um, again, I apologize for not being able to address all the wonderful questions that we got, but we will be sending those to the speakers who can address them offline. And I'd like to conclude by thanking our speakers for sharing their research and Caitlin for introducing each of one of them. The uh, Canal Series will pause in February as the new Canal Class of 2021 gets all set up, but we'll be back with more seminars on March 18th. Any last comments, speakers? Okay, well then, thank you very much, audience. I truly appreciate that you've, appreciate that you've joined us today for uh, the seminar. Uh, the library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community to support the NOAA fellows, and we hope you will join us again. So be well, thank you. <laughs>